Hello, Anthem family. We are so glad that you are here this Sabbath. My name is Joelle Royer, and I am a pastor here on staff, one of actually 19, believe it or not. So we have an amazing pastoral staff. And on behalf of them, we just want to wish you a really delightful Sabbath. We're so glad that you're here. And, you know, if you are new to this community, we really hope that you make Anthem your home. We would love to have you a part of this family so that we can love on you, get to know you better, and just join you in community. And speaking of community, if you would like to get better connected here at Anthem, we would love for you to meet us out, maybe in the rain, maybe not, out at the Growing Disciples Center, out in the courtyard. But if you wanna get connected and you don't feel like socializing that much today, just dial in, type in 55498, and you can see ways that you can get connected and involved. Here at Anthem also, I know we sit and we enjoy a really good service, but we also believe in the act of giving. We believe that giving is also a part of worship. So we invite you to participate in giving today. There will be some individuals passing around some baskets, but you can also type in the number 55498 to contribute that way as well. We have a few things that are happening. One thing is, if you did not realize it yet, is Easter. Easter is sneaking up on us next weekend. We have an incredible service planned for next week, starting Friday night. If you cross over to the other side, to the main sanctuary, we're gonna have a really special program starting at seven o'clock. We invite you to come. It's going to be one of those just reflective contemplation services of what Christ has done for us. The death on the cross that he um, died, that just horrific death. And then on Sabbath, come right back here. We're gonna have a celebration Sabbath, celebrating what he did for us. We also have something very, very, I think you're gonna find it very awesome for those of you who are in relationship, which means all of us, right? Not just those individuals that are in romantic relationships, but if you find that some of your relationships are a little tangled, you'll want to come to untangling our relationships. If you have parents, which we all do, parents, siblings, colleagues, um, some, of your, uh, some of you are students, so you're dealing with teachers and all sorts of things, we invite you to come to the seminar. You do need to register at youthrivelluc.com and come out, it's two weekends, starting Friday night, April the 5th, so it'll be a Friday night, a Sabbath afternoon, and then the next weekend as well. So we invite you to come out for that. You know what? We have some amazing small groups here in Anthem. Some of you out there are a part of them. And I invite Jesse up, who's almost up here already, to give us an update on what's been going on. Sounds good. Can I get uh, Roger and Hefsuba and Michelle? to come on up here. So we've just had a whole session, a seven week session of small groups that have been following Pastor Randy's sermon series on how to read the Bible. And it's been really cool because we've gotten to, to sit down with the literary context, the historical context, and go through that in a way that at least for me was really cool. But then on top of that, it's just awesome to be in community with one another. So I got a, a Michelle, who's one of our small group leaders up here, and Roger and Hefseba, who are also uh, some of our small group leaders. And just wanted to ask them a couple of questions to uh, just to, to talk about this session. So first of all, what about some of the content of, of the session itself was, uh, was especially meaningful? Um, so I can think for my group as a lot of young adults, um, mostly. So a lot of us are kind of baby in our face still and trying to figure out how to um, understand scripture and apply it to how it's relevant to us today. Um, and just working through that together with other young adults was really powerful um, for the content wise. And being able to see different patterns repeated and understanding how that can be 
repeated today with us and how to not repeat those same patterns was like very helpful for us, I think as young adults who are still trying to grow our faith. Yeah, how about you guys? Hey, the uh, material's written excellent. Kudos to you. Uh, we, we had a uh, multiplicity of different amounts of people. We had old and young. We had people on fire for Jesus Christ, and we had people that are non Adventists uh, and Adventists, and all of us just had one common goal is to know Jesus more intimately. 13 to 15 people got together every week. We would start with the ambitious material, and then questions would emanate and flow from it that would be about relationships, how God loves, saves, and uh, all those things got answered in there. So just this core text of questions and material just led to a greater fountain of knowledge. Yeah. How about on the like relationship community side of it? Um, you get the opportunity to go through seven weeks with the same group of people. So tell me about that. Um, for uh, my group specifically, as young adults, we're still trying to get our careers started. A lot of us are still in school. Um, so for community-wise, just having a space where you can just show up when you can show up and not have that thrown back in your face you just you had a long week like if you're tired if you're energetic if you're ready to go like that was accepted all around because we're all going through that same kind of walk um so no judgment there so that was just really great to have a young adult community to support you in that how about you guys hey i thought it was 10 weeks so when i text you and said hey what's going on um <laughs> We have professors, we have students, we have med students, dentists, and all of us said one thing, let's go 10 weeks. So we meet for dinner when we go out to dinner, and that community is still going to go, and we're just still going to grow um, that relationship and community even more. Well, yeah, guys, can you give them a hand? They, they both, uh, both sets here led groups. Stephanie's not here. She co-led with you. Um, but yeah, we're going to be starting our next session of groups in middle of April. So if you're interested, we're going to start announcing that next week. Uh, it's a huge thing, guys, to be part of a community of other people that are following Jesus with you. So I want to encourage you guys to do that. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jesse, for all that you do in getting those small groups together. Okay, well, guess what? It is time for the awesome part of the service where we get to hear a message from Pastor Randy. He also is going to be doing something very special with a child dedication this morning. But I just want you to get your hearts ready for what the message he is going to share with us. One of the key ingredients to understanding the Bible better is looking for main characters. So today, Pastor Randy brings us part six of the series, Understandable, digging into scriptures and understanding and getting to know God's ways, God's character. And Pastor Randy, I invite you just to come up right now for your special child dedication and message. Have a great Sabbath, everyone. I'm going to invite the Hoyt family to come up and join me here on the platform. So Nathan and Joan are being brought forward by their little one, Hope Gracie. Let me see, Joan, careful here. That's a little bit delicate there, yeah. All right, here we go. Come on up and we'll stand here. Isn't it great to have a young family here and bring in a child in dedication? We're just delighted. This is Hope Gracie who is saying, are all those people applauding for me? <laughs> Wonderful family here. Uh, Nathan is, <laughs> she said amen to that. Nathan is a psychiatrist at the VA, and Joan is a stay-at-home mom right now. And Gracie, I think, has become the center of this family for understandable reasons. Now, Nathan hails from the southeastern part of our country, Florida, Georgia, and that area, although he's been out here in California for years. And Joan, you hail from the Philippines. You've also been here for years, though. You all been married for about 11 years, and I just have to tell you that this little child has been desired and hoped for and prayed for. In fact, mom and dad say that Hannah and Samuel and that whole story in the Old Testament about a child that was desired has been very meaningful in their life and experience. And so this is a particularly significant day for them, for their family. This is a family that loves being in the outdoors, loves walking. They're looking forward to times when they're going to be able to go to the beach and those kinds of things, except this young girl is not all that wild about being in the car seat. And so that makes going to the beach a little bit of a venture. But the day will come when she'll know what's at the end of that road and she'll be delighted to do it. 
They do. She is active. <laughs> they do come as, as a family here to a family. Now, I just want to tell you that every time we do a child dedication, we invite family and friends to stand. However, Joan's family is in the Philippines. Nathan's family is across the country. So we're their family. So would their family stand for the dedication? I want you to look at that out there. This is your family right here in Anthem, and we're just delighted to be a part of your family and your friends. Thank you so much for standing for this very special moment. You may be seated. Mom and Dad have written a simple statement about their love for and desire for their little one. Dearest Hope Gracie, you bring so much light and joy into our lives. It is our prayer that you be a tiny sunbeam from the brightness of God's love shining on this dark world. Love, Mommy and Daddy. What a great statement. We talked about the fact that a child dedication is not just dedicating little hope, although it is that. It's also dedicating the two of you. By this time in the parenting journey, you already know that you're going to need the wisdom and the love and the grace of God to guide you. But it's not only dedicating the three of you, it is dedicating all of us to be the kind of community that can be safe for our little ones, in which our little ones can grow to know and understand God as a good and a gracious God. So we're going to say a prayer, and we're going to see if hope wants to be with, held by the pastor or not. So you give us a moment here while we have our, our decision-making process here. All right, Nathan, let's see. I'm going to keep you facing there where you can see Mommy and Daddy and beautiful. I think we're good. You think so? All right, let's pray together. Gracious God, it's just such a joy to hold little hope in my arms to think about the fact that you gave us as human beings the privilege of participate with you in creating life. Wow. So we bring her to you in dedication today, praying that the Spirit of Jesus would be with her not only today, but all the days of her life. Bless her deeply, bless her richly, and bless her in an enduring way. Pray for mommy and daddy and all the other family. And Lord, we pray for Anthem. We all stood to say we're your family. So bless her is our prayer. And all of Anthem said, amen, amen. You held out hope. That's beautiful. Amen. God bless both of you. We love having you here at Anthem, and we wish you his riches, grace, and blessings. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I've got to grab my Bible here, so it's over. Thank you, Jesse, very much. Appreciate it. So I want you to think for a moment about being in the classroom. Just imagine for a moment you're in the classroom, and there in the classroom, the teacher goes to the board and writes a statement on the board, and you read that statement, and the teacher says to you, I want you to decide whether or not this statement is true or false. The past means more than it meant. Now, I don't want you here to decide too quickly because I want you to think a little bit about the implications of that statement. The past means more than it meant. So a story. There was a woman years ago, some of you who have a little gray in your beard like I do will remember this name, Ann Landers. Ann Landers was an advice columnist here in this country who was syndicated uh, in newspapers across the whole country and probably around the world as well. People would write to Ann Landers with questions, relationship questions primarily, and she would dispense wisdom. But on occasion, somebody would write her a story. So somewhere in my files, I have a story from Ann Landers that when you come over and help me straighten out my files, we'll find It'll be a little bit of newspaper, kind of ragged around the edges that somebody sent to me, which a woman wrote to Ann Landers and said, just this past weekend, I just came back from celebrating our parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Our parents had five kiddos. They didn't have a lot of money. Our dad was a police officer. Our mother was a teacher. They had even less money when they first got married. So when they got married, their honeymoon consisted of driving down to the next wide spot in the road and staying at a high-end resort named Motel 6 for the night. That was their honeymoon. So they decided at that point in time, when we have our 50th wedding anniversary, we're going to have a blowout celebration. 
But we're going to have to have enough money to do that. And we don't make a lot of money, and we're planning on having a lot of kids. So here's what they decided. They decided that they would have a jar that they would keep, and every time they made love, they would put a dollar in the jar. <laughs> and then 50 years later, they'd see if they could afford more than Motel 6. <laughs> So they followed that. They followed that practice every time, a dollar in the jar, a dollar in the jar. The woman writing to Ann Lander said, we don't know how much they saved. They didn't tell us directly, but we do know this. This was back in the days when you could still go to the gate with the departing passengers. We do know this. We, we, we took them to the gate. They were flying first class to Hawaii and staying at a really nice place. <laughs> All expenses paid. And as they got on the plane, my dad turned around, looked at us, and said, Tonight we're starting a fund for Cancun. <laughs> I love that story. Now, at this moment in time, if you're anything like I am, you're saying, What in the world does that have to do with this? And what in the world does that have to do with a series called Understandable? Well, here's what it has to do with it. There was one more piece of the story. What they did, the parents is that every time one of their children grew up and got married, at the time of their marriage, they would give them a can. And they would say, this is what we did. We recommend it to you. The kids got together and got to talking, and they realized they had memories of dad coming home from work, of hugging them and really hugging mom, and then saying to mom, I got a dollar in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> And mom said, I know just how to spend it. <laughs> now, I want to suggest to you that at this point in time, when they were kids, they understood that. What did it mean? It meant dad had a dollar in his pocket. That's what it meant. But now, all these years later, when they're adults and they're getting married and they're finding out, they're saying, well, we knew... Oh, 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 okay, now we get it. So that the past means more than it meant. You with me? What if Scripture is that way? I mean, about that, okay? What if Scripture is that way? Because we're talking in this series today about something that theologians and scholars called the Christocentric nature of Scripture. What that simply means is that it's the Christ-centered nature of Scripture, that if we want to truly understand Scripture, we have to look for the main character, the main character being Jesus throughout the entire Bible. Now, maybe you say, all right, I'm, I'm with that. I can do that in the New Testament. If I'm studying the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's easy. Jesus is on every page. He's front and center. I don't have to look far to find the main character. I might struggle a bit with some of what he means, and I definitely will struggle at time with some of what he calls me to and asks, but I can find the main character. When I get into the book of Acts, it's not that much harder. It's still there. The epistles, the same thing. Jesus Christ over and again on every page. Even in Revelation, when I account for the genre that's a bit difficult, nevertheless, the Lamb emerges over and again in that book. So if you say, you're asking me about the New Testament, I'm good. I can find the main character. A lot of explaining, a lot of learning, all that to do, but I can find it. But if you're talking about I mean, I want to give you a sense of how much of the Bible is the Old Testament. So from about right there, this is New Testament that's Old Testament. If you're talking about that, well, that's a different ballgame altogether. How do I find the main character there? Well, that's a question asked by two people, two disciples of Jesus. We're going to join them mid-journey and mid-conversation, a conversation they're having with a stranger, stranger with a capital S. It's first day of the week. They have left Jerusalem behind and the catastrophic events that have happened there this past weekend. In fact, it's not just the death of their dreams. It's the death of the dreams, not just of 
a lot of people now, and not just of tens of years or hundreds of years, but of millennia. All of it has come to a crashing halt at a place called Calvary. It's over. They're leaving Jerusalem. They're headed toward Emmaus. We're not quite sure where Emmaus was, it was and is, but we believe it was to the west, northwest of Jerusalem, which means they're headed toward the setting sun. It's afternoon. The sun is going down. They're heading into darkness in more than just a physical sense. They're in bad shape. How do you explain this? And then this stranger joins them, starts asking questions. And they're like, where are you from? Do you not have any idea what's just happened? And he says, what? Well, it's right there that we join the conversation. Luke chapter 24, we begin in verse 19. They've just finished telling him about catastrophic events. Verse 19, he asks, what thing? About Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. Now, we may not be exactly certain of the geographical location of Emmaus, but we can be exactly certain of the emotional location of these disciples. The first four words of verse 21 tell us, but we had hoped. Past tense. It's over. Dejected, despondent, depressed. That's their state. But there's something rather odd against which that is colliding. And that comes in the next two or three verses. In addition, verse 22, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So picture the scene here, what's happening. They have this, this we had hoped perspective, dejected, despondent, depressed, but there's this thing that they don't quite understand. Alive? What are you talking about? We don't get that. How in the world do we make sense of all of that? And now the stranger speaks. Notice what he says. He said to them, that's Jesus, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Moses and all the prophets and a few verses later down in verse 44, he'll add the Psalms. So he's saying Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. That was the entire corpus of what we today call the Old Testament. So what the text is saying, what Luke is telling us is Jesus opened up the Old Testament scripture and explained it to them so that it made sense what had just happened. In other words, he found himself, he found the main character in the Old Testament. How does that happen? What does that mean? Well, maybe last summer, if you were with us, you may remember we spent quite a bit of time looking at Revelation. One of the things that I became deeply aware of and have continued to be aware of as I continue to study it, but we didn't mention much back then, is that the Old Testament is just a wash. Pardon me. Revelation is just a wash in the Old Testament. It's all over the place. Now, there are a number of ways you can notice that. I'll mention just two. The first is you can think about quotations. Maybe Revelation quotes the Old Testament. We all know what a quotation is. I just read uh, some quotations this morning. I'll read in a moment from N.T. Wright. Quotation, if you've done a middle school paper, a high school paper, you take the exact words, you put them in quotes, or you indent it, you give the citation, that's a quote. Now, scholars are somewhat divided, but some say Revelation quotes the Old Testament exactly zero times. Others say, well, I don't know. There might be a few. But the bottom line is that is not how Revelation deals with the Old Testament. There's a second way. 
And that is illusions. Illusions. Making an illusion to something. That's something you mention in conversation. You may not know the source of it. You may not know all the details about it. But it has become well known enough in the common parlance that you immediately get it. What if somebody who died 15 years ago came to life today and heard somebody talking about being ghosted? I have no idea what you... What? What is ghosted? But we know that. It's part of the common parlance. The common... It's an illusion. We even know that in terms of literature. For example, what if you hear someone say, well, that's a real Romeo and Juliet relationship. The person who said that may have no idea that that comes from a Shakespearean play. They may not know all the details of it, but they do know that's probably a hot, passionate, young, forbidden relationship that's headed for tragedy. That's a Romeo and Juliet relationship. Or somebody says, wow, that's a real catch-22 and they know what they're talking about is there's a situation where two things are involved and you can't win. You can't do them both. They may not know there's a novel by that title written by Joseph Heller. They, they may not know all the details, but they get what you're saying when you say, that's a catch-22. Those are illusions. Now, in Revelation, there are not dozens, but hundreds of allusions to the Old Testament. In fact, a conservative estimate is 400. Some will place it higher. That's in 22 chapters. In other words, it's all over the place. So that if you want to understand Revelation, you have to know the Old Testament. Because if you're wanting to understand some of these allusions we make, one of the best ways is go back and read the book. Then you get the full sense of it. Same thing is true here. What if then... That's the way we look for the main character in the Old Testament. That sense of illusion of what the whole story is about. So from the eminent British New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he says this. When Luke says that Jesus interpreted them all the things about himself throughout the Bible, he doesn't mean that Jesus collected a few or even a few dozen isolated texts versus chosen at random. He means that the whole story from Genesis to Chronicles the last book of the Hebrew Bible was Chronicles. The prophets came earlier. Pointed forwards to the fulfillment which could only be found when God's anointed took Israel's suffering and hence the world's suffering onto himself, died under its weight, and rose again as the beginning of God's new creation, God's new people. This is what had to happen, and now it just had. So Jesus is saying, look at the story, look at the movement, look at the flow, be attentive to the illusions that are now coming true. Why were they missing it? Wright continues, they, like everybody else in Israel, had been reading the Bible through the wrong end of the telescope. They had been seeing it as the long story of how God would redeem Israel from suffering. But instead it was the story, the short end of the telescope, of how God would redeem Israel through suffering through, in particular, the suffering which would be taken on himself by Israel's representative, the Messiah. So he's starting to explain this to them. Our question is, what might that look like? So let's take just one example. So don't hold me to every detail of the timeline, but this is the broad brush strokes that are uh, that are generally accurate. So let's talk about Abraham all the way back here, probably somewhere around 2000 BC. Down here we come to David, probably somewhere around 1000 BC. Then we come down here to the cross after the change from BC to AD. This is somewhere in the 30s AD. And then somewhere around here in the 90s A.D. is Revelation, the book of Revelation. And then down here, here we are somewhere in the 2000s A.D. Okay? Now, what if we look at one metaphor that appears all the way back here and then take note of how this might be true and might help us understand how to find Jesus in the Old Testament? So I want to go to the one of the, I think, worst stories in the Bible, Genesis 22. Genesis 22, God tells Abraham, go sacrifice your son. Horrible. 
are you talking about? Sacrifice. The one you've promised me? I don't understand this. What do you mean go sacrifice myself? You know what bothers me, though? I mean, the fact that God commands that's horrible enough. What kind of bothers me almost even more than that is the fact that Abraham gives him no pushback. I mean, he's like, what are you talking about? You tell me to go sacrifice myself. That's psychotic. What do you mean? No way I'm doing that. And yet when you read Genesis 22, it appears that without complaint, Abraham does that. What in the world? One of the most important things to do, and we've talked about it in this series, is to talk about context. So let's say a word about the understandings of the gods in Abraham's setting. The land which Abraham has been promised, the people who live in the land where Abraham is entering, worship their gods. You can look this up in some horrific ways. One of which is child sacrifice, burning their children in the fire. It is expressly forbidden by God later. So why does he command Abraham to do that now? Now, if we say the past means more than it meant, it means that the past did mean something. So what did that mean to Abraham? Well, we follow him in Genesis 22 as he climbs the mountain with Isaac, as they build the altar, as he places Isaac on the wood, as he raises the knife all the way up to the moment when God says, Stop! Stop! And then he says... And this is the enduring metaphor that we consider here. The metaphor of the lamb, although in this case it's a ram, but it's the same context and same meaning. He says, stop. There is a ram, a lamb caught in the thicket, and that's what Abraham sacrifices. Abraham learned something there. And the way we know that he learned something is that he names the place. The old King James Version, it was Jehovah Jireh. The name of the place was God will provide. Now, what the past meant here is that as in opposition to the gods of the nations around him, God is saying, what I require, I will provide. And that's why Abraham says, that's the name of the place. In the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What God requires, God provides. The nations around them, what their gods required, you provide it. What God requires, God provides. That's his lesson. Now the centuries, the millennia pass. We come all the way down here so that now we are doing a discipline that if we're going to understand the Old Testament in a Christ-centered way, we have to learn to do. And that is we have to learn to read backwards. To read backwards. In other words, we have to stand here and we now read back to that experience through the lens of Calvary. Now here's what happens when we do that. When we read backwards, knowing the experience on Calvary, and we read Genesis 22, certain things begin to jump out at us. First thing is this. They're climbing a mountain that in this period of time is called Moriah. It will later be known by a different name. It is a mountain that will be made famous by a city called Jerusalem and a hill called Calvary. That's where they're climbing. We notice as we read Genesis 22 that twice the chronicler, as he writes, uses the word together. He says the father and the son went on together. The father and the son climbed together. And as we're reading backwards from this perspective, we're saying, wait a minute. The son wasn't alone here. He wasn't alone at all. The father was with him. And then we read backwards and hear Isaac saying, Father, here's the wood. Here's the fire. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Four decades ago, I heard a preacher say it, and I've never forgotten it. That becomes the enduring question of the Old Testament scripture. Where is the lamb? 
for thousands of years. The enduring response of the New Testament is, Behold the Lamb. Where is the Lamb? Behold the Lamb. And above it all and beyond it all, the song of heaven is, Worthy is the Lamb. But all the way along, the metaphor is the Lamb. The Lamb, in a way, Abraham never could have understood it. But when we're reading backwards from this perspective, we say, My, my, my. God is teaching Abraham, what I require, I will provide. And that becomes the remainder of the story. Whatever he requires of you, he will provide it. That's why Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. So that right here, the past meant something. It meant something, absolutely. But as we continue to journey through time, what becomes true is that the past means more than it meant. Not to be sacrilegious, but just like Dad saying, I got a dollar in my pocket. The kids understood that. What did it mean? It meant he had a dollar in his pocket. Until like, oh, okay. God will provide what he requires. Abraham learned that. But praise God, we understand it in a way he never could have. And that same reality continues to unfold over and over again throughout all the Old Testament scripture. Joseph's saying, you intended it to me for evil. God intended it for good. Paul will later pick up on that theme and will say, in all things, in all things, in all things, God is at work for the good of those who love him. Job, in the midst of his wrenching sorrow, somehow clings to a shred of hope which was very immature at his point in time, not well understood at all. But he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last day he will stand on the earth. In my flesh I will see God. It's one of the unique and almost alone statements of the Old Testament about that. What happens when we move down beyond Calvary? We have Jesus saying, I will return, bring you to myself. We have Paul saying, he will descend from heaven. We have John the Revelator saying, the lamb will win the battle in one day by the truth that he speaks, and he will stand at last on the earth. And our knowledge and our understanding just keeps growing, telling us that the past means more than it meant. If we really want to understand Scripture, if we really want to understand the Old Testament, we have to look for the main character. One more right N.T. Wright quote. He says this, Only when we see the Old Testament as reaching its natural climax in Jesus will we have understood it. Equally, we will only understand Jesus himself when we see him as the one to whom the scripture points, not in isolated proof texts, but in the entire flow of the story. So I've been thinking about my parents lately. My dad went to his rest in Jesus 11 years or so ago. A few years out of, after that, a fog descended into my mother's mind. She's physically alive, but we've lost her. I've been thinking about them, especially in light of this. Now, I've been thinking how they did what, what so many parents try to do, what so many parents hope to accomplish, just like our parents today, Nathan and Joan, will do for little hope. Is, is they told us things. They wanted us to learn and understand certain things, things in our past that meant something. One of the things, mom, my dear mother, precious mother, diminutive woman, one of the kindest, happiest, most humble people you'd ever want to meet. One of the things that both by word and example she taught us was to cherish the moment. It might be when we were all cleaned up and pajamaed and we gathered around her elbowing each other, wanting to sit the closest to mom as she read us stories, causing us to say, one more, mom, one more cherish the moment or those times as we got older and we would come home and 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 mom would say i want you all at the table bring your friends i don't care who come but i want you here i want my whole family around the table she loved that 
love preparing the food. And we'd be like, Mom, sit down. Sit down. Come sit down. Just sit. No, no, no. I want to make sure. Because she was cherishing the moment. I remember in particular one thing she used to say. By the time we were older now and gone for college or moved to another state, and we would all converge for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Time and again, at night, Mom would say, it's going to be a good night because I got all my children under one roof. Cherish the moment. Do you know what? That meant something to us in each of those settings. It meant something. But it didn't mean anything like what it means to me now. When my own children come home, say, bring, bring your friends, bring them all. Doesn't matter. But we want you here. Tonight's going to be a good night because we're all under the same roof. That meant something then. It means so much more now. Because the past means more than it meant. And that's what Jesus does for us in the Old Testament scriptures. He just says to us, keep following the story. Notice the illusions. Notice the the way it unfolds. And find me there. Because when you do, not only will the Old Testament come to life, but you will also discover That in a very powerful and a very sweet way, the past will mean more than it meant. 